from the Psych Hub Podcast Network. Hi, I'm Marjorie Morrison. And this is Patrick Kennedy. And you are listening to the Psych Hub Podcast, the future of mental health. When people from other places come, we see violence. And it's all built on a myth that white heterosexual males with power and privilege are supposed to be in charge. They're supposed to have the resources. And the reason it's a myth is because most people don't have those resources. So they're fighting for something that is not real. They're afraid of losing something that's not real. Hi, and welcome back to the show. Today, we're going to be discussing a very important topic, the intersection of race and mental health. One of the good things to come out of the past few years has been the greater reckoning and understanding of institutional racism. The systems embedded in American society often treat people unequally based upon their race. And this affects how people see themselves, how they interact with others, and so consequently, it also affects their mental health. Today's guest, Dr. Janet Helms, has been studying these problems for over 40 years. She believes, as we do, that all people should be treated equally, but that's not what happens. And so she has dedicated her career to understanding how and why that is. In doing so, she has pioneered amazing work on the need for mental health services providers to acknowledge and address racial and cultural issues in their practices and institutions. Dr. Helms' work has been acknowledged with many awards, including the APA APH Gold Medal Award for Life Achievement in the Public Interest. Dr. Janet Helms is the Augustus Long Professor Emeritus in the Department of Counseling, Developmental, and Educational Psychology and Director of the Institute for Study and Promotion of Race and Culture at Boston College. Dr. Helms, thank you so much for being on the show. I know our listeners are going to really enjoy and learn a lot from this. Well, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate your having this conversation with me. Dr. Helms, if you had a magic wand and were to inform white people as to what could they do to better understand what it is to be on the white side of this racist system in terms of how we absorb the messages and we've been socialized in a way that we might not even be aware of ourselves. Did someone pay you to ask that question? (laughs) They could, of course, read my book. A race is a nice thing to have, a guide to being a white person or understanding the white people in your life. Because what I do essentially in the book is to help white people recognize the ways in which they have been socialized to cope with race and to decide whether or not that's how they want to continue to cope or whether they want to develop more humanistic, people-oriented ways of coping with race in the society. When you are socialized in a system in which you are the majority, certainly the political majority, it's very difficult to see the ways that racism is built into our systems. And so what I try to do is to help people begin that journey at the individual level, because I think if you can understand it at the individual level, then that stops you from interacting interpersonally in ways that are harmful And if we can stop people from interacting harmfully with each other at a a personal level, then collectively we can begin to change the systems in ways that do not treat people equally because of their racial group membership. Dr. Helms, what made you decide to write that book? What what was it? And it's not, not an easy feat to do to write a book. Well, there is a story. When I originally began doing this research, I was an assistant professor. And I wanted to get promoted. And to get promoted, you have to publish in Research One Universities. And so I thought it would be good if I studied the racial identity of people of color, but particularly Black people. But when I submitted my manuscripts, they often got rejected. And the editors would say, well, how do you know there's any difference between how white people are socialized and how Black people are socialized? Of course, to me, that seemed evident, but it wasn't evident apparently to many, actually to any of the white editors that I submitted my work to. So my research team and I began asking white people how they developed, how did they learn to think about themselves as white people? And so as a result of that, I developed white racial identity theory. A lot of work went into collecting information from white people so that I could document what it was that I said 
But actually, I think about white racial identity as the socialization that people of color often have automatically in their lives, but don't have the language for. So what I do with white racial identity theory is to give not only white people a language for thinking about themselves, but also people of color a language for understanding the different perspectives or orientations of white people as they engage with them. I submitted white racial identity theory to journals, and it was a way apparently that no one had thought about white people. And so that's kind of how I got into the work. And that's how I've continued exploring both sides of the issue. What happens with white people? What happens with people of color? Given the awakening that the non-minority community has come to in the wake of George Floyd and Eric Garner and the modern day Emmett Tills of our time, we are now finally focusing on your research, Dr. Helms. I'm sure you've been uh, working away in the vineyards for years, wondering when are people going to finally pay attention to the work that I've spent my career doing. So could you tell us a little bit about the bittersweet moment that this is? There is more focus and there is a different focus. In the 1980s, when I started, the work was met with a lot of hostility from the academic community. But over the years, they've become progressively more accepting of it. And because of the way that we introduced the book, A Race is a Nice Thing to Have, we introduced it in college campuses. So now there are people who have come of age who read the book. And so they are more able now to communicate about racial issues and they are more accepting of it. And as they become more accepting, their families, their colleagues, their peers become more accepting. And so in general, we've gotten acceptance from people who knew about me before, but also because now there's such a retrenchment, if you will, with respect to racial diversity, people are looking for someone who can help them understand these issues And so it's become more accepted because I do have a reputation for having investigated these kinds of issues before. What are some of the practice changes you'd like to see amongst uh, the education of your uh, peers in, in mental health provision of services all across the spectrum, including psychologists, to sensitize them to have the better approaches when um, working to treat a very diverse population? Well, I usually begin by uh, trying to help people differentiate between race and racism and culture. Mm -hmm. Because often when we really should be talking about race and racism, we're talking about culture. For most people, culture is a positive thing. It's how we survive. It's our language. It's our traditions. Culture doesn't really cause us problems. Uh, Culture uh, makes us feel happy when we think about it. Race and racism is the problem, but it's what we are afraid to say. I sometimes talk about race as the four-letter work because people uh, don't want to say it because to say it acknowledges that there's a problem and they don't know how to solve it. So what I then do usually when I am training people to be more sensitive about such issues is to help them see how race actually interacts with their work with their clients. For instance, it's very hard for people to understand that being exposed to racism is traumatic for people of color, even if they were not in the setting. So the murder of George Floyd had negative consequences for people of color, regardless of whether they were Black people, even if they were not in that environment. And so if someone is reacting to that, Sometimes a mental health professional doesn't understand that. How could you be reacting to something that didn't even happen to you or to someone you know? So I try to help people understand that there are generations of trauma that people have experienced. And so many incidents trigger their post-traumatic stress reactions. And so rather than discounting them, we have to think about how they affect people's subsequent behavior, particularly their mental health behavior. So if it's post-traumatic stress that collectively people of color experience both on a policy level with systems and the kind of interpersonal racism that gets expressed because people are socialized by a a racist viewpoint that they might not be aware of, like, 
how is it that you deal with that trauma that's just ubiquitous, it would seem to mm-hmm. me, amongst anybody of color in the country who've grown up in this environment? And that is what I try to help people do, uh, to, to acknowledge that, in fact, that there is this trauma. The mental health uh, field for such a long time has assumed that what works for white people would necessarily work for people of color, particularly Black people and Indigenous people, without recognizing that the traumatic experience uh, of one group is not the same for the other group. So the interventions have to change so that we help the people of color. And one way the interventions have to change is by acknowledging their experiences of trauma rather than minimizing them, and then to help them externalize them. Because when the world says to you, you're wrong, you don't experience this pain, then it's difficult to get over it. But if the world, the powerful person says to you, I, I hear this pain, I understand this pain, and let's see how we can work through it, then that has a different kind of outcome, hopefully. What are your thoughts about the practitioner provider's willingness to really change the viewpoints. Do you have any kind of favorite stories you could share with us? It's sometimes something as simple as a white therapist in training who comes in and says, in effect, I don't know how to treat this client of color. What do I do? And so it's in the process of helping the therapist in training recognize that it's not a matter of thinking about it in terms of how do I treat this client of color, but rather thinking about it in terms of how do I treat this person. And so it's helping, um, in this case, her to begin to think about why it is that she conceptualizes this person as someone who needs something different than a person who was white would need. And when I say that, that might sound contradictory to what I just said to Patrick. But what it does mean is that whatever the person looks like who's sitting in front of you, you would usually diagnose their trauma and treat it. But often we think because there's a brown or black or whatever color skin attached to the trauma that we shouldn't treat it. So what I try to help the therapist do is to recognize how she sees the world influenced by how she saw that client. And then as she begins to do that, she begins to be able to untangle the system issues. So why is this client feeling traumatized? What does it have to do with the system uh, that uh, the client is interacting with? It also has to do with her orientation. Why does she automatically assume that she would be helpless to work with this person? And so that's her white socialization. How do we deal with that? And then there is the, the actual dilemma of the client. Has the client internalized the trauma that he or she experienced? Presumably they have, because to be working with a mental health professional, something happened. And so now we have to begin to figure out how the trauma has affected that person. How would you say, Dr. Helms, how much awareness and self-insight? I mean, you know, as a nation, we're just coming to some realization because of covid that everybody's impacted in their own lives with the mental health. Just because we had, we're isolated, we have time to reflect, we felt our feelings as opposed to burying them in work or whatever distraction we usually use to cope with them. And of course, it was during that same period of stillness when we were able to pay attention to the, the trauma of the George Floyd crisis uh, unfold and, and all the successive killings that took place and the fact that we had to pay attention to them because the world stopped as a result of COVID. Would you say it's widely majority of Black people would automatically know that they've been subjugated to this uh, racist system? Or would you say that they don't always know it or they've compartmentalized it or coped with it in a way that they weren't aware of how it was impacting their mental health. I would say that Black people have always known that something was wrong. They haven't always known how to label it and they haven't always known how to essentially treat themselves for it. We wrote racial traumas real for Black people and people of color so that they could understand that when they were 
suddenly drinking obsessively, for example, then that might be in response to some traumatic event that was happening to them. Or when they uh, were angry all the time, that that might be a trauma reaction to what was happening to them. So I think Black people have always been aware, and they've certainly been aware that police mistreat Black people because uh, Black men, actually, Black women are not, but Black men are socialized to deal with the police in ways that hopefully will not get them killed if they have to interact with police. Black women are not similarly trained, but hopefully we can work on that one. I think the question, however, is more a question of awareness for white people. Because I think that for the first time, perhaps, many white people became aware that these kinds of things happened. It was not unusual for Black people to tell their stories and to have people say, well, you must have done something wrong. And to some extent, that's what they said in response to the George Floyd incident. But I think the fact that many white people essentially were confined to quarters and so therefore had to witness this event. For them, that helped them to think about, at least for a short period, that the system was not working fairly for Black people. But we always have these competing forces in our society. One force wants things the way they are. I I call that the force, essentially, of white heterosexual male privilege and power. And the other force wants to change and become more humane. So what's happened is that I'm afraid that the awareness is dying and the privilege dimension is gaining a stronger foothold in the society. And that, to me, says that there's still a lot of work to do. And particularly the people who were aware have to do that work. They have to come out of hiding. They have to say what kind of society they want it to be. Well, we're working on justice reform at the Kennedy Satcher Center at Morehouse School of Medicine. And we're trying to really base it on what has been shown to be effective in reentry programs, irrespective of race, to help reduce recidivism in the hopes that we can make this a nonpartisan issue, right? Because I do see your concern about the pendulum swinging back and forth to the point if we're not fighting this based upon real world outcomes that as opposed to political ideology, we could lose the fight because it could continue to swing back and forth, which is hurts a lot of people in the process. But I agree with you. That's why all of us have to do our part to change things. And we can't wait for someone else to do it. We have to try to do it in our own lives. When Dr. King got the civil rights movement, it was based upon a personal commitment to the belief that everyone is a child of God and they have to first internalize that in order to be able to have the strength to do that nonviolence, which took enormous strength. That was a movement born out of not a political movement, but a spiritual reckoning that that everyone had to have in order to make that work. It's interesting you say spirituality because I often say to people, a spiritual connection is how I think people change. When I say spiritual, I don't necessarily mean religious. I mean, whatever it is that's the morality that we're born with, if we can get in touch with it, I think that's what inspires change. I'm worried that we may have lost that spiritual connection to each other, but maybe I'm just being a pessimist. Talk a little bit in your perspective about reactive mindset that kind of default mode that we seem to be living in collectively, which has polarized our society and created such toxic politics and so forth. When you think about how the country was founded, it was founded on the principle of white heterosexual male power and privilege. And for generations, we've all, regardless of our race, have been socialized to think about that as the way it should be. So any threat to that way of socialization essentially generates violence. And we've seen it with respect to gender. When women wanted to vote, there was violence. We've seen it with respect to race. When people were no longer property, we saw violence. When people from other places come, we see violence. And it's all built on a myth, I think. 
that white heterosexual males with power and privilege are supposed to be in charge. They're supposed to have the resources. And the reason it's a myth is because most people don't have those resources. Most white men don't have those resources. So they're fighting for something that is not real. They're afraid of losing something that's not real. And so the question is, how do we begin to help people see that there's something better for them than living on this mythology that they are currently existing in? I think it's going to have to happen eventually because the country is diversifying so much that people are saying, well, we need to change the way in which we've been socialized. We need to begin to think about how do we share with each other? How do we care about what happens to each other? Mm -hmm. That's not a traditional male way of thinking about the world. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, we're uh, in a process of re-socializing the society to think about it not as a male society, but more as a humane society, a society in which people really are equal, really do get to share resources. And maybe that's an impossibility, but I don't know. We'll have to try it and see. Well, if I could, like the economic system, the way it's designed is going to make it impossible for us to think of sharing everything because the system is set up to increase the disparities in, in wealth and income, especially as we so rapidly go towards a society of technology taking over the power of people to, to earn a living, make a living in this digitalized information age that's going to constantly take people's jobs away and put them into these supercomputers. And then, of course, as you know, the capital keeps getting concentrated and concentrated and concentrated. Even if it's the white people who don't know they're fighting for a myth, there's this economic insecurity that's just exacerbating that racial polarization. I, I, I agree, but most yeah. white people don't even have the economic security. It's only a small percentage of the population actually that has the wealth. That's right. And so in some sense, the, even if you think that you are fighting for economic security, you probably are not because you don't control that. At, at some point, I think one has to begin to think about how do we engage the poor white people with the issues of their poverty, which was what Martin Luther King was involved with when he was uh, murdered. Because if you have a coalition that's not built on race per se, but is built on common concerns, then I think you can begin to get people to maybe behave more rationally than mm -hmm. often they seem to be. Thank you so much for all this wonderful work you're doing. I have a feeling that you have such a greater impact um, and making it such a big difference than you'll ever know because of the way it trickles down into communities. Thank you. I hope that that's true. Um, I don't know how you all found me, so I have, I have to assume that that is true, that it trickles one way or another. Thank you. As always, thank you for listening to our podcast. If you enjoyed the show, drop us a review. If you haven't already, subscribe to our podcast for the latest episodes. For the latest insights, check us out at psychhub.com. 